Well, the message tonight, grace poured out, It'll be in First Timothy chapter one. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and then what we're going to do is we're going to break it down verse by verse. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no doctrine, no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love, from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for the murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, although was, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I love that verse. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may not learn not to blaspheme. We know that the Apostle Paul, he wrote this epistle, he wrote this letter because he tells us, and it's verified in the first verse of chapter 1. We know that this book was written between about 63 to 65 A.D., he had completed his three missionary trips. He's now in Rome uh, on a house arrest uh, from prison where he had been imprisoned in Rome. This isn't going to be the last time he's in prison, but he just got out of prison this time. This was also Paul's first letter to a young pastor. We know that Paul calls Timothy his son as he hit, like he's taking him in. We also know that Timothy was the first pastor at the church of Ephesus that Paul had started. A little bit about Timothy, though, is we know he was born with, he was born into a mixed family, being his father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew. Timothy was actually, by being this way, a half Jew and half Greek, he would have been caught between two cultures. To the Gentiles, he would have been considered a Jew. But to the Jews, he would have been seen as worse than a Gentile. They would have looked upon him as if he was a dog. As one studies this letter, they will see that most of it, it deals with a pastoral conduct. He, he, uh, Paul, he warns about false teachers and the church's responsibility toward single members, towards widows, toward elders, and also towards, say, uh, towards slaves. Now, we know that Timothy, being half Jew and half Greek, it was going to cause some problems because he wasn't circumcised. And so, you'll, as you read into the, more into some of Paul's letters, you'll see that this would have been a Big, huge, uh, how would you say it? Uh, it, would have, it would have definitely caused a lot of problems within the synagogue if things hadn't, he hadn't taken care of things. So we go back to verse 1. Paul, he, here he, of course, he says again, he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. So Paul, he opens this letter by stating that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
by the commandment of God. He declares his apostleship to Timothy and has done the same in other letters. It makes you wonder how many people say that, you know, I'm, I'm John Baldwin and I'm a Christian or I'm so-and-so and I'm a Christian. You know, we sometimes might want to, do I really want to tell people? You know, <laughs> Maybe I didn't act quite responsibly, but, you know, the thing is we have to remember is we're saved. We're sinners saved by grace, and we're going to make mistakes. I remember when I was at Calvary Pearl Harbor, we had a homeless guy that lived. The shopping center was kind of a, a U-shape where we were at in the old Moana Lewis shopping center, and it was a loading dock, and there was always a lot of homeless back there. And the assistant pastor, I remember Frank, Pastor Frank, he was, at the time, he's probably maybe in his late 20s, but uh, the school teachers would cut across from, instead of going all the way around, and one of the homeless guys threw a soda on her, and Frank seen it, and he was going to go over there and lay hands on him in the wrong way. And I said, Frank, man, you can't, you can't be beating up that homeless guy. He says, well, I'm a Christian. He says, I can beat him up, and then I'll get forgive. I'll be forgiven. <laughs> I said, well, we're not supposed to do that. We're, <laughs> we're forgiven, but we're not supposed to beat him up and then ask for forgiveness. But he declares his apostleship to Timothy. In Ephesians, Paul says, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So what's the difference between a commandment and the will of God? Well, actually, they're the same thing, but they're not exactly synonymous. All the commandments which we find in the Bible, Bible, they actually, what do they do? They reveal the will of God. As one commentator stated, he says, I do not think that we have revealed to us all of the will of God. Even in the sum total of the commandments in Scripture, the will of God, he says, is therefore a much broader term than the commandment of God. He says we need to remember that we have revealed to us enough of the will of God to know that man is not saved by obedience to the commandments of God. He says this is important since there are many today that say the law is essential to our salvation. Now, there's a lot of people, I would imagine there's people even within our church here that think that you're saved by the Ten Commandments, or they think that we're saved by baptism, and and that's not true. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians that he was an apostle by the will of God, that was true, because we know that all of Paul's letters, all of the 66 books, the, or the 60, in the, in the, between the books and the letters within the Bible, were all inspired to man by the Holy Spirit. But when he wrote to Timothy, he says, he says, I am an apostle by the commandment of God, meaning that Jesus had made him an apostle. I believe it is in Acts chapter 11, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, It was after Paul got saved, he was still Saul, and you read about it in Galatians, he was actually led into the desert for three years. There was a three-year gap in, in in the book of Acts that we don't see or hear about Paul. We go back to Peter, but there's three years in there, and what it was, he was led out towards Mount Sinai, and Jesus Christ taught him literally. He was out there by himself. So, Paul said he was, he's unworthy to be an apostle, but Jesus had said, he says, I command you, and that is the reason Paul could walk into a synagogue or go before an audience in Athens or a group of sinners in Corinth and boldly declare the gospel. I believe the only reason why that people are scared to share uh, the gospel with other people, tell other people about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done upon the cross for, for themselves is that they're scared of rejection. I mean, everybody's been told no about something at one time or another in their life. But we need to remember what Jesus said. He says, when you go forward, he he says, his Holy Spirit is going to be the one that's going to give you the power that you need to share the gospel. It's, It's, and I'll tell you, there is no nothing greater in this world than Jesus Christ like giving us the opportunity to share the love with, of him to, with someone else. And then ask them, have you ever given your heart to Christ? And they may say yes, or they may say no, or they want to rededicate their life. And Jesus has given us the opportunity to go and to be the one that does that. Somebody else may have planted the seed. We've, they may even say, well, I'm not ready yet. And we shouldn't let that drag us down because we have planted that seed or we have watered that seed. I mean, think about it yourself. The first time that you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
Did you say yes? I know I didn't. I was almost 43 years old before I came to the Lord. I mean, I thought I did when I was about Caleb's age, but you know, about 11 or 12 years old, and it, I wasn't. So we'd have to look at it as not so much as Jesus is commanding us. Jesus is saying, hey, I love you so much. I want you to go do this for me and share the, the love with others. But Paul was, he was bold. He was, he, he was, he was a soldier in, in Jesus' army, and he was under orders. He was an apostle by commandment, not by commission, but by commandment, by Jesus telling him to go forth and do these things. No one had laid hands on Paul. We don't see anywhere in the Bible where someone had laid hands on Paul and supposedly prayed for him for the power that he needs. That, that didn't happen. But Jesus had personally gave him the authority. And every one of us has been given that authority the moment we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We said, we're willing. We love you, Jesus. We want you to be our personal Lord and Savior. We are going to do your work. But you know, there sure are a lot of pew warmers in the churches today, I guess you could call them. But in verse 2, Paul says, To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from our God, our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. When Paul he had written these letters to various churches, he he greeted them with grace, and he greeted them with peace. We even see that in the letters that Jesus had John uh, write down when he had spoke to the seven churches of, of, in Revelation. And in those churches, Jesus had even said great things about them in the beginning, but then told them the things that they needed to change. But Paul, he does pretty much kind of does the same thing. And in this letter to Timothy and to Titus, he added mercy. He adds the word mercy to the greeting. And we know that God, he grants his mercy, his grace, his love, his peace, not only to churches, but also to the individuals that being every one of us, not just here, but every one of us in the churches, in the Christian churches today, God grants these things. There's no difference. There's no difference in the grace, mercy, peace, love that God granted them 2,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago that he granted Adam and Eve that he grants to us today. See, God is love. It's God's nature. It's one of his attributes. Mercy is another one of his attributes. And it, 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 mercy is that in God, which he provided for the need of sinful man. Could you imagine being born and, not, and, and, and knowing there's no way that you could possibly be saved? There's no one out there. But the thing is, there is. We know there is. And people still reject the name of God. I think Kurt mentioned it last Wednesday night. The Democratic Party has even denounced God in their party. We know they want to take in God we trust off the money. I think, hey, if you want to take in God, you don't want God on your money, then give the money to the church. I mean, it's no big deal, right? <laughs> church will take it. You can leave God on it all day long. We'll take it all the time. But you know, it's so sad to see these things. You know, it's I can remember when I was a kid, uh, up until I think right after JFK got shot, got killed, we had prayer in school. We would every morning stand up in front of the flag, do the Pledge of Allegiance. We would, the principal would come over to the loudspeaker, and we'd all have a moment of silence, and we'd have a moment of prayer. But then we kicked God out. They kicked God out of the schools. Well, you kick God out. Who's coming in? Satan. When I was on recruiting duty in upstate New York, they had metal detectors in the schools, and this was back in 85 and 86 and 87. It was tough. It was there was a lot of bad things going on in schools. But in verse 3, Paul says, he says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, he says, telling Timothy, he says, Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they may teach no other doctrine. Now, Macedonia was actually a, a Roman province on the Balkan Peninsula, which is the northern portion of modern Greece today. And Thessalonica and Philippi were also located there in Macedonia. And Ephesus was a harbor city located in Asia Minor, which is actually the country of Turkey today. I know there's churches out there that, you know, you can go on, instead of like tours to Israel, you can go on these tours of, of where uh, on Paul's different journeys. be kind of interesting. But Ephesus was one of the largest cities of the time in the Roman Empire. And Paul, he had went to Ephesus on his second missionary journey. We see this in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And he spent three years there. We know he was a tent maker there. 
And in his farewell speech, he'd warned the Ephesian elders about the threat of false teachers. Isn't it interesting? 2,000 years ago, he was warning them about false teachers. And we see this in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 31. And for this reason, Paul, he urges his son Timothy, his spiritual son Timothy, and the believers to hold on to sound doctrine. You know, like the, the technology we have today is great if we use it in the right way. I mean, whether it's these smartphones or the internet or TVs. I remember they had the iPad, iPods, you know, and all these other things that they had out there that you can use. And, but, you know, on, on the smartphones today, uh, the things they have out there, you know, a guy told me here a couple weeks ago about Clark County Library, you can actually get an app and you can download these uh, Audible books. So I went on there and I went to the library last week and I got it and I ordered uh, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. I don't know if you've ever read it. If you haven't, I would encourage you to read it. It's a, or download the app and, you know, I had to wait, I don't know, five or six days before it came available, So I, which is good because it tells us that there's a lot of people reading it. And you can read it and you can listen to it. And I put the Bluetooth in and as I'm making my rounds in the park, I listen to it for about three and a half hours. And then the next night I'll do the same thing. Or you can get, you know, I was telling the, the, the youth that in there one Sunday, there's another app out there called Bible.is. And there's, gosh, there's got to be uh, 50 different translations of the Bible. I, I don't know, I listen to the English Standard Version because it's in a theatrical version. And every person in the Bible has a, is a different person, whether it's a male or female. You can hear the water running. You can, like, when the... Uh, you can hear the, you know, the, the Roman soldiers pounding the nails into, the, into Christ. You can hear them ripping the, temp, the, 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 the veil in the temple. It's very neat the way it's done. You know, and you get into the revelations and the angels are singing and so forth. It's quite interesting. And you just put it on and listen to it. You know, there's just so many things out there that we can do, which uh, helps us to strengthen our faith, helps us to learn more about Jesus Christ. You know, instead of listening to... Some of these radio stations out there, you know, you can listen to the true word of God. But, you know, he says here in verse 3, or 4 rather, he says, Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in fault. Now, a fable refers to legendary stories about the gods, the gods being a little g. These stories actually, they distracted from the truth of the gospel message and the sound doctrine that re would truly resulted in good godly behavior. And the genealogies were actually a record or an account of uh, the ancestry and the descent of a person. It was very important uh, back then and, and even to this day of genealogies. You know, you can, I, I know Keiko, for Keiko, for example, she's full Japanese and you can go back in the genealogy six or seven hundred years probably until this white boy come along and kind of ruined the, 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 the genealogy a little bit, you know. But uh, you can, you can go back. But the genealogy is for Jews so that they knew that they were actually of the Jewish faith. But some believers in Ephesus may have used genealogies uh, possibly to exclude others from fellowship or coming into the ministry. You know, well, you're not a full-blooded Jew, you can't come in. You know, you're, 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 you're like Timothy was. But here Paul argues that no one, absolutely no one should be excluded. Rather, uh, prayer should be made for all because God wants all people to be saved. In verse 5 he says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Warren Wiersbe states, he says, there's three things that should be manifest in the church. The first is, he said, the first is faith, faith in God and in God's word. Now, as a Christian, we have to believe and have faith that all 66 books are God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, all the way to the very end of chapter 22 of Revelation, where the last word is, amen. We cannot pick and choose. You can't take a... a a black sharpie and say, I don't like that verse. Oh, that one's not, I don't like that one either. Or take a pen knife and start cutting it out, you know, and ripping pages out. I mean, I, I've even heard that they have, uh, certain people have ripped pages out of the Bible that pertain to their 
their lifestyle in, in some of the hotels. I, when I was living in Hawaii, they, that was a big thing that was going on about that. But the second thing Worsby says is love. Love, he says, is not something we simply say all the time. He says love is an active concern for others, which means we won't gossip about them or in any way bring harm to them. Faith should be lived out in the life of a church, and love should be lived out. If faith and love are lacking, you have nothing more than a lodge, a religious club, or some sort. But if faith and love are manifest, he says the form of government is not too important. You know, in the church, if, if, a, if a, 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 someone comes in, a visitor on a Sunday or on a Wednesday night, and they can't feel the love within the church, you have about a 99.9999% chance they won't come back. They, they, they have to feel welcomed. How many of you ever been on vacation and you've gone to a church? And you go into a church and no one even says, hello, how are you? It's, it's, it's sad. It really is. The third thing he says is that should be manifest in the life of a church is a good conscience. He says, I don't believe that conscience is a good guide even for a believer, yet a believer ought to have a good conscience. He says, when you lie down at night, do you feel bad about something you've said or done during the day? I know I have. I have. Sometimes I don't even have to wait till I go to sleep. You know, you get convicted by the Holy Spirit. I remember one time, uh, our youngest daughter, Erica, when we were living in Hawaii, it, somebody had backed into her car. No, it said, had rear-ended her. So we had to take it over to the body shop over in Waipahu. And the lady that was there was kind of a snob. Or maybe I was, I, I, maybe I was the snob. <laughs> I was probably more than she was. But I gave her the blame in the beginning. So she says, go over there and sit down. So I wait over there about 30 minutes, and, and, and she still hasn't come. And I, I went over there and kind of told her what I thought. And I said, you know, we've been here 30 minutes. And I said, you know, this, this is really poor. We, we need a little better customer service here. I'll get to you when I can. Well, finally, about 15 or 20 minutes later, she says, let's go take a look at your car. And, and, and I was walking probably half as far from here to that door, and I got convicted by the Holy Spirit saying, John, you really blew that one. You need to apologize to that lady. I thought, apologize? So we go out there, and she's looking. She's got her thing. She's writing it down. And I looked at her, and I said, ma'am, I said, I want to apologize for the way I acted. I said, I'm a Christian. And I said, the way I spoke to you was wrong. She says to me, she says, the enemy will sometimes get at us, won't he? <laughs> I thought, you got that right. But it's so true. But if we get angry, if we say something bad to somebody, it's not their fault. It's our fault. And I, it was my fault that I set, talked to her the way that I did. So we don't have to wait sometimes till we go to get ready to go to sleep before the Holy Spirit convicts us. And many Christians are like that. It's good to have a sensitive conscience, so to speak. And then there are those who have consciences that have been seared with the hot iron, the Bible tells us. In other words, they're insensitive to what's right or to what's wrong. In verse 6, Paul says, from which some having strayed and have turned aside to idle talk. Idle talk simply means empty chatter, beautiful words, or a flowery language. Those, you know, those people that uh, want to try to butter you up or pat you on the back, but their words are empty. That means nothing. I had a guy, I probably had it... <laughs> Especially if I wear my hat that says retired Navy on it. You know, you always got somebody coming up to you and saying, hey, thank you for your service. I had a guy tell me the other day, thank you for the service. I said, sir, you need to thank these guys that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that's missing arms and legs. They're the ones you ought to be thanking, not me. Thank them. Thank them. Thank them for the, the services that they've done. I think it was yesterday we were at, at, at Costco, and a, and a guy said, trying to sell me some kind of Water purifier. I, I didn't need a water purifier. Either that or, yeah, it was that. Because the other guy was solar, and I already had solar on my house. I say, that's guy. I don't need it. He says, I hope you have a good day. I thought, you could care less if I have a good day because I didn't stop and talk to you, right? It, it makes it sound good. But verse 7, Paul says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they 
affirm. In other words, Paul, he makes it, makes it clear for those who teach in error and they, they do it with self-confidence. You have many false teachers out there that are teaching and, and, and truly, I think they truly believe what they're teaching. It, it gets to the point where they have lied so much. They're pimping the prosperity of the gospel of the word of God and they're doing it for money. You see it happening many times in these false churches. They're saying and doing things. What does everybody want? Health and wealth. What are the prosperity preachers preaching about? Health and wealth. Give us $100 and God will give you back 1000 Give us 1000 God will give you 10000 And if you don't get your money, you don't get your 1000 or your 10000 back, tenfold back, you know what they say? It's your fault because you don't have enough faith. <laughs> but they've got your 100 They've got your money. But it's your fault. I've always wondered, don't you, you guys must have taken the book of Job. You must have taken all of Paul's letters out of the Bible. You must have taken the, uh, the, the writings of King David out of your Bible. What about Abraham? What about Noah? All these guys were righteous in the eyes of God, and they all had problems. But they want to make it our fault. Look at verse 8. Paul says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, the law that Paul is speaking about here is the Mosaic law. So let's talk a little bit about this before we go further. The Mosaic law was given specifically to the nation of Israel. We see this in Exodus chapter 19. We know that the Mosaic law was made up of three parts, the Ten Commandments, the ordinances, and the worship system, which included the priesthood, the tabernacle, the offerings, and the festivals. Now, we... See, the, the purpose of the Mosaic Law was to accomplish the following. First, it revealed the holy character of the eternal God to the nation of Israel. The second thing is we, it set apart the nation of Israel as distinct from all other nations. God wanted the other nations to be jealous because of what he was doing for the nation of Israel that these other nations would want the same thing. But what was so unfortunate as we read the Old Testament that the, the nation of Israel turned away from God. Man, I tell you, you read the book of Judges, and it, it's just so sad. They, they, God would let them wander on their own for 7, 15, 20, I think the furthest was 35 or 40 years. One time he even let them go for uh, 70 years before, it, it, you know, what it says, and God heard their cries. Well, God heard their cries from the very beginning. But if you people want to be that way, then go ahead. I mean, look at what he did with uh, the, the people that came out of, initially out of, out of Egypt, the first generation died because they were a bunch of complainers, whiners and stiff-necked and so forth. But the third thing we see is that the law reveals the sinfulness of man. Whether you're saved or not, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you can see if you're, what type of person you really are. Although the law was good and it was holy, as we see in Romans 7, 12, it did not provide salvation for the nation of Israel. Even though the high priest once a year would go in and pour the blood on the mercy seat, it still did not fully, as Jesus Christ would come thousands of years, a few thousand years later, he was the ultimate sacrifice for all. The fourth thing, it provided forgiveness through the sacrificial offerings, which we see in Leviticus for the people who had faith in the Lord and the nation of Israel. You know what is neat is when you read the Old Testament, it wasn't just those that came out of Israel, I mean came out of Egypt. Those that came from other places, as long as they came to believe in the true and living God and they were circumcised, that as the Israelites were, then they became Israelites as well. They were, they were given the same benefits and the same rights. But in, in the fifth thing he says, it says is it provided a way of worship for the community of faith through the yearly feasts. It provided God's direction for the physical and the spiritual health of the nation. And the seventh thing is after Jesus came to see that they couldn't keep the law, but needed to accept him as their personal savior because Jesus fulfilled the law and he paid the penalty for breaking it in his death, his burial and his resurrection. If we don't believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and we don't believe that there's one God in three people, Christianity means absolutely nothing. I had a guy, the, uh, 
done a Las Vegas rescue mission. He told me he was a Messianic Jew, but he didn't believe in the Trinity. I said, that's impossible. It's impossible. What he did was he gave me about three weeks so I could teach on the Trinity. <laughs> so everybody would down there would know the truth. But look at these two scriptures up here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Paul says, therefore, he says, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Romans 10, 4. He tells the Romans, he says, for Christ, well, he doesn't tell the Romans, he tells the church at Rome. He says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Listen to what he says. To everyone who believes. See, that's the key. We have to believe. We have to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And the Bible tells us we will be saved. So the believer in Christ has the righteousness of the law fulfilled in him as he obeys the Holy Spirit who lives within him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 4, Paul says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The Bible also tells us that the law is written on man's heart. Man knows if you steal something, it's wrong. Man knows that if he commits adultery, it's wrong. He knows if he's a murderer, it's wrong. It, it, even those that use God's name in vain, they know it's wrong because as soon as they find out that you're a Christian, most of them, not all of them, my supervisor, he got one of the worst mouths of anybody I've seen. You know, they say a, a, a drunken sailor <laughs> got a bad mouth. I'll tell you what, he spoke a whole lot worse than I did when I was a drunken sailor. I'll tell you that much. He's bad. But most people will, oh, they think of you as a Christian, and then they don't use God's name in vain. But it's on, it's on our heart. We know it's wrong. We know it, to covet for something is wrong, and you got all the Ten Commandments. We know that as a child, if you do something, you don't obey your father and mother, you know that it's wrong. Right, Caleb? Okay, good. <laughs> no, he's already told me that before. Just pick it up. He's a good kid. Have you ever made a choice to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, realizing that he has fulfilled all the commandments all the time? He even paid your penalty by, for you breaking them? It makes you wonder, why wouldn't somebody want that? It's, it's better than hitting the lottery. It really is. There, there's, there's no greater choice you will ever make in, this, in your entire earthly lifetime than the day you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can go to Romans chapter 7, look at verse 13 to 25. Paul talks more about the law there. Now let's look at verse 9 to 11. Paul says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, that's kind of neat. If I left anything out, he says, if it's according to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel, the blessed Jesus Christ, which was committed to my trust. So he's covering them all. It's kind of like, you know, he's seen it. I think it was in Ephesus where they, uh, there was a sign to the unknown God. I think it was in Ephesus. You know, they wanted to make sure. And then what's Paul say? Hey, let me tell you about this unknown God that you guys don't know about. It was a, really, it was an opportunity for him to share the gospel with these people. But we see here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. You know, and when we lived in Hawaii, Hawaii was kind of like a melting pot in a way for the world. I mean, there was just about every nationality you could possibly think of there in Hawaii. And the beautiful thing was here on a Sunday or a Wednesday, whether it's morning, Sunday night or, or Wednesday or, or the men's breakfasts, the ladies' teas, whatever was going on, you know, there was all different nationalities of people coming together, serving Jesus Christ. You know, nothing is so sad when someone says, well, Jesus is a white God. No, he's not. No, he's not. Jesus is for everyone, anyone. The Bible said, anyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
You know, it's like I tell the guys up at the prison, if we, you know, you up there a lot of times they, they kind of segregate themselves. You know, there's like the black guys over here, the Mexican guys over here, the white guys over here, and it'd be like sometimes maybe one or two Asians sit in the back. I say, come on, let's all get together. We all join together and we mix up. Well, we can't do that in the galley. I said, we're not in the galley. We're in the chapel. If we can't get together now, how in the heck do you think we're going to be able to get along in heaven? Let's practice while we're down here. Let's practice while we're here. But you know, contrary to popular belief, I'm not okay. And I'm going to tell you something, neither are you. We're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner in need of a Savior. And once one comes to that understanding, they no longer are under the demands of the law. See, we don't need the law. We need Jesus Christ. Because once we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we're going to stop doing the things, maybe even breaking those Ten Commandments. We're not going to use God's name as a swear name anymore. We're going to use God's name as a praise name. We're not going to covet what someone else has. I don't know, I may have said this before. You ever, you ever work on something in the wintertime, you smack your thumb, you know, like you pound a nail and you hit your thumb? It feels like it's about to throb off and... You know, and back in the world, we would use God's name in vain. Anybody ever done that other than me? Okay, good. <laughs> well, not good, but I always wondered, if you smacked your finger, how come we don't say Buddha damn? You know why? Because it has no power. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of God the Father. There's power and the Holy Spirit. But you and I, were saved. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. In verse 12 to 14, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Ministry, it simply means service. In the original language of the New Testament, there's, there was nothing high or spiritual about the word. You know, people think, well, I'm in ministry. I am above everybody else. And no, you're not. You are no better than anybody else. I, you know, you, there was a, I can't remember the year. I know his name, but I remember D. James Kennedy. He he had he was on a pulpit. I'm not kidding you. He must have been up here. We were at a Calvary Chapel at a conference down in Tucson, and you had to walk up 12 steps to get to the to, to the podium. So he's on he's 12 feet standing on a platform, 12 feet higher than everybody else. I'm thinking why. What makes you above us? No one is above anybody else. We all have different callings. We uh, Don's to worship. You know, I'm to teach. Mike's security. Whatever it is, you know, the children's ministry. Amy and Nancy. Whatever it is, we're all called to do different things. The person that cleans the toilet is no greater than the pastor. And I'll tell you, nothing I hate worse than someone says, I am such a spiritual person. I'm your way down. <laughs> I used to have a guy in our church, he'd tell me that almost every week. I am a godly man. You know, he would have like a deep voice when he would say, I am such a godly man. I thought, really? <laughs> I, said, I looked at him and I said, that's funny. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. <laughs> I said, I don't want to grow up and be like you either, Charles. That was his name was Charles. I said, I don't want to grow up and be like you anyways. But, you know, faithfulness made Paul usable by God. You know, we have to be humble. Think about it. Why do we raise our hands when we worship? What are we doing? We're surrendering. You ever tried to run from the police with your hands up? Or better yet, you ever tried to run a marathon with your hands up in the air? It don't work. That's why we run like this. We put our hands up. we got to humble ourselves. What did we do when we accepted Jesus Christ? 
We humbled ourselves, did we not? We said, I can't do it anymore on my, on my own, Lord. I need you. When we pray, what are we doing? We're humbling ourselves. We often see our Christian service as a matter of volunteering. We say we need volunteers, but as a Christian in regard to Jesus and his church, we're not volunteers. We are duty-bound servants of Jesus Christ, and faithfulness is expected to such servants. I have said ever since I've been in a church, there shouldn't be a sign-up list. There should be people banging on a nursery door and a children's ministry door saying, Amy, I want to help serve the children. I can play the drums. Don, I, need, I want to play on Wednesday nights or, I don't know who, Jordan, I think Jordan's the worship leader on Sunday mornings, isn't he? I don't know. I, Jeremy, Jeremy, yeah, Jordan's the older the other brother, the older brother. Anyways, we, there shouldn't be a sign-up list. It should be a list of people wait. Uh, it should be more of a waiting list. That's what we should have in church is a waiting list so that as soon as someone maybe moves or, or, or drops out, they've need to take a little sabbatical, so to speak, you can say, call, get on the phone and say, hey, I got an opening. How about uh, helping us out here starting Sunday? But it doesn't happen. I remember Pastor Darrell used to always say, they would teach nine months during the school year and then three months of summertime, they would, they'd have a break and there would be somebody else. And it was very hard to get people to sign up. He said, I'll tell you what, if I don't get anybody to sign up, he said, I'm going to bring the kids out here next Sunday. I'm going to have them all crying up here on the stage saying, nobody will teach us. You know, trying to put a guilt trip on the, on, the, on the parents, you know, but it was kind of funny. Everybody always signed up. But we're bond servants of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, after Paul was saved, he became a foremost saint. He said the Lord did not allot him a second class place in the church. He had been the leading sinner, but his, his Lord didn't say, I save you, but I, will, I shall always remember your wickedness to your disadvantage. Not so, Spurgeon said. He counted him faithful putting him into the ministry and into the apostleship so that he was not a wit behind the very chief of the apostles. He says, brother, listen to this. Brother, he says, there is no reason why if you have gone very far in sin, you should not go equally far in usefulness. I used to tell the guys in the, when, when I was doing uh, the most excellent way and uh, when I was over at Lone Mountain and I had it for about three years, it was, it's an addictions ministry. I said, you know, you, you know, guys, we could spend from 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon when we got off work until midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning drinking and doing things that we didn't want to. And you mean to tell me you can't spend 30 or 45 minutes a day reading the Bible and praying and talking to the Lord, but you can spend all these hours doing these things in the world and you can't do a little bit of time. You know, you got people to say, well, I, that, that's that 10 miles away from my, from my house to church. I can't drive that far. But we'll drive to L.A. to watch you too. Or we'll go spend $180 and listen to George Strait down here at the uh, T-Mobile Arena. People will do that. But they haven't got time for Jesus. Verse 15, Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners he says, of whom I am chief. The closer that Paul drew to Jesus, the more he understood the extent of his sin. It should be the same way with us. The more we draw closer and closer to Jesus, the more we know how much we are a sinner saved by his grace. But the good news is that sinners are the very people Jesus came to seek and serve. He came for us. J. Vernon McGee says, when you give your testimony, make sure that you don't tell people how wonderful you are or all you have accomplished. He says, tell them you were a sinner and that Christ saved you. He says, that is what is important. When Paul says he was a chief of sinners, he's not using hyperbole. He's using high-flung oratory. He's speaking the truth. He was the chief of sinners. He blasphemed the Lord Jesus Christ and shot out, a, shot out his lip at him. But Paul says, I have been saved. And that's what we ought to be saying. I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. McGee says, the Lord Jesus came to save sinners. And if you say, I don't think Christ can save me. He said, I'm the worst. He says, you're wrong. Paul says he is the chief of sinners. And the chief of sinners has already been saved. So you will be able to be saved if you want to be. The decision rests with you. 
All you need to do is turn to Christ and Jesus will do the rest. All I can say is amen to that. Verse 16, Paul says, However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul also says, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him, talking about Jesus. This explains why God loves to save sinners. They become a pattern to those who are going to believe on him. God wants others to see what he can do by, by working in us. I'll tell you, I don't, when I first got saved, I thought, how in the world could the Lord use a sinner like me? Paul was a chief. In the Navy, that's an E7. I was a master chief. That's an E9. I'm two pay grades above being a chief. <laughs> so, Paul, I got you beat, man. <laughs> but I thought, Lord, how can you use me? And I did a character study on the Apostle Paul. I thought, man, I've never killed anybody. I think the only thing I ever stole was a couple of pieces of bubble gum out of the Greyhound bus station when I was in about the sixth grade down in Westfield, New York. Other than that, I don't think I've ever stolen anything. I know I haven't, I haven't always been a good guy by, by no means, but you, you look at some of these people that's in the Bible, and we look at the Old Testament, and they were all sinners. They'd done some bad things. But you go to Hebrews chapter 11, and you look at the Hall, the hall of Faith, they're nothing but good people saved by the blood of Christ. They put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. God wants others to see what he can do by working us. You know, it's so interesting when you go up to prison, you see some of these guys that have been murderers. They've killed people. They've done some very bad things. These pedophilers. I, I, I'm quite interested in it. Well, I don't want to say it's because we're on camera, but I can tell you about it later. But you see some of these guys that have done some pretty bad things, and they come to know Jesus Christ. You see him up there actually preaching. High Desert State Prison is one of them here in Nevada that lets the inmates actually preach the Word of God. It's, it, I'll tell you, it's really interesting. We were, uh, this must have been about five or six years ago. We had about 20 minutes left, and I said, let's, let's do a time of prayer. And I had probably about, there's probably about 60 or 70% of the guys in there were, were, were Spanish, from Mexico. They couldn't, a lot of them couldn't speak English. And so I opened it up, and nobody was responding to pray. I said, hey, look, I had this guy who could speak, translate for me. I said, tell him that God understands Spanish, <laughs> just like he understands Japanese and Tagalog and German and everything else. He's the one who created it. He can understand it. This guy in the back, he stands up, and he starts praying. I could understand a couple of things, Jesus, Padre, and a couple of other words that he was saying in Spanish. And he must have prayed for 10 minutes straight. And I don't know, the, the, the Holy Spirit was, was just working on the hearts of these other guys because I don't think there was a dry eye in that room. There must have been 50 guys in there that morning. And when he said amen at the end, it was just, it was beautiful. But he told me that he had been in lockdown in Ely for 10 years. 10 years. That's 11, that's 23 hours and 15 minutes a day in about a six by eight cell. I said, why? Because I wouldn't conform to the system. They had to break me. And then they moved him down here. I couldn't imagine that. In a six by eight cell, 23 hours and 15 minutes a day. That's where he was. And the kid was on fire for Jesus. You know, the son of Sam, remember the serial killer in New York back in the 70s? You know, he has never requested to be paroled. He believes God has him where he is today for a reason, and that is to witness to other inmates. Remember Jeffrey Dahmer? He gave his heart to the Lord before he died, got killed in prison. And there's a whole bunch more, a whole bunch more out there. But verse 17, Paul says to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible to God who alone is wise. He says, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Paul turning from a blasphemer into a believer, he has no other recourse but to, to burst forth in praise. Remember what Paul told the Romans in his opening letter to them? He says in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, for it is the power of God to salvation 
for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I bet you every one of us can say the day we gave our hearts to Jesus Christ, our lives started to change. Because if they didn't, you really didn't accept Jesus Christ. I know there's people that say, well, it may take me six months. It may take me three months. No. If you truly gave your heart to Jesus Christ, your life is going to change because you were instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to change your life. Remember, darkness can no longer live in the light. Again, Paul uses the word charge. He says he did in verse 3. It's a, really, it's a, it's a military word that refers to an order by a superior or a, a commanding officer. And this is what this is, is actually Paul's personal charge to, to young Timothy as a man in the ministry. Paul says that by them you may wage the good warfare. In other words, never fight a war unless your heart is in it, unless you're fighting for a real cause and intend to win. You know, if, uh, say, uh, one of the countries uh, was going to invade Amer came and invaded America tonight, and we didn't even know they were coming. The, the, the army's going to regroup. The Navy's going to regroup. The Marines, the Air Force, they're going to come up with a strategic plan. That's why they're training time and time and time again for these different events that could possibly happen. I remember during the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, it took us three weeks from Yokosuka, Japan, to get up into the Persian Gulf. We trained every day as if there was an anthrax attack. If they had to shut the scuttles, if they had to shut off the ventilation, putting on the chemical protective ornament suits and the gas masks, it about killed us from the heat down in the engine room having to put on all that stuff. But we had to pretend as if it was real. And guys would break their gas masks and I'd tell them, fall down on the deck, you're dead. Because as soon as you broke the seal on your mask, the anthrax gases came in and you was going to die anyways. It gets so bad it was sweat inside your gas mask and you'd have to drink your own sweat. It was that bad. But we prepared. We were ready in case something happened. We did have a, 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 one of the Russian MiGs that was driven by, flown by one of the Iraqi uh, Air Force that came at us. It, you would normally take being on, I was on the USS Midway, which is, if you ever get the chance to go down to San Diego, it's a museum down there, it's great. And it usually would take seven minutes to set Zebra on the ship. We did it in about three and a half minutes. In half the time, everything was sealed up, except for the ventilation. And they knew they couldn't turn it off because it was going to kill us. But in three and a half minutes, we were ready, and one of the, our planes, our jets, shot it down. It was interesting because the night before, we, we went in and, and attacked Iraq. The admiral came over and told us what we were going to be doing. And the, and the military chaplain went up and prayed for the prayed for us. We're down in the engine room, or down in main control for the engines in the boiler rooms. And we're, as the planes are leaving, we're doing tick marks on the plexiglass. And as we're coming back, we're wiping it off. Everyone that left came back. We didn't lose a plane. We were the oldest aircraft carrier out there, all by the grace of God. Look at what Paul says in verse 19. He says, "Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith." have suffered shipwrecked. Paul now changes his illustration from a soldier to a sailor. If anybody knew about a shipwreck, it was definitely Paul. He warned Timothy that the only way to succeed was to hold fast, hold fast to his faith and have a good conscience. It's not enough to just proclaim the faith. We must practice it and we must apply our faith to our daily lives. We're to hear it. We transfer it to our heart. We transfer it to our hands and we apply it. Verse 20. In closing, Paul says, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that may not learn, may not, excuse me, they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what Hymenaeus and Alexander did, but Paul had prayed to, to the Lord to remove his protective hedge from them, thereby exposing them to the enemy. Sounds pretty harsh, don't it? Makes you wonder why. Well, Paul's hope was that they would get burned out on their evil ways. Paul's purpose wasn't disciplinary, rather it was restorative. 
I know we used to say in AA, if you haven't drank enough, you haven't done enough drugs, you can go back out there and do some more. And when you get sick and tired of it, then come back where we can help you. And it's so true. Same thing with the church. If you don't want Jesus, then go back out there and live your old ways. And when you come back, maybe you'll want Jesus then. But here's the thing you have to worry about. A person has to worry about is that God will turn them over to their own rebate minds. You may like that lifestyle so much. You've denied Jesus so long. God says, fine. And do it your way. You know, in this chapter, we saw six different reasons why we should follow the pattern of Paul's command to Timothy to remain in Ephesus and not to ever give up. We look at the first three here. In verses three to seven, because we need the truth. We need the truth of the word of God. When I first got saved, I was in a four square church. They believed in a lot of this charismatic stuff. They believed in the Big Bang Theory. I don't know about you, but I played with firecrackers or M80s, and if you blow something up, nothing ever good came out of it. (laughs) But that's what they believe. We need the truth. I honestly believe if a person starts out in one of these churches, maybe it's even a word of faith, a word of life, whatever you want to call them churches, these prosperity churches. If a person says, I truly want to know the Word of God, If you start out down there in Joel Osteen's church, wherever it may be, Joyce Myers or Marilyn Hickey or all the rest of these phony balonies we got out there, as Jude calls them, clouds without water. If you truly want to know the truth, you cry out to the Lord, God will teach you. God will show you the truth. Them verses, man, will be like, they just reach out and smack you right across the forehead. In verses 8 to 11, because we minister in hard places. I'll tell you one of the hardest places to minister is to your kids, especially when they get older or they walk away from the Lord or to your brothers and sisters or to maybe somebody at work. And then in verses 12 to 16, because God uses unworthy people. You're like, well, what do you mean unworthy people? Well, go in the bathroom and look in the mirror. <laughs> He's using each and every one of us. In verse 17, because We serve a great God. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, as he'll be tomorrow. He never changes. He's always the same. Verse 18, because we're in a battle and we cannot surrender. You know, the apostle John says, I think it's in 1 John chapter 2, that if a person walks away from the Lord, it's because they never knew him in the first place. Think about that. That's a pretty harsh statement, I think. What do you mean, Lord, I walked away because I didn't know you? That's right, because you never knew me. Because if you truly know me, you won't walk away. You might walk away, but I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit is going to grab you by the nap of your neck and turn you around, and you're going to come running back faster than you ever left. You won't stay gone long. We're in a battle. I remember it was Pastor Chuck used to say, the day you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, the BB on your back became a bullseye. Any of us has given a heart, we've probably all know here, we've all given our hearts to the Lord. The enemy doesn't let up. The more you try to do for Jesus, the more he's coming at you. If he's not coming at you, you're not doing anything for the Lord. You're warm in the pew, or in our case, the chair. Verse 19 to 20, because not everyone has strong faith. You know, I was listening. CSN, for some reason, hasn't been on the radio for the last three or four weeks. Something's wrong with the radio. But I'll tell you what. There's an app. Go to this Get CSN app. You can Bluetooth it. (laughs) About three or four, before they went off the air, a couple weeks before they went off the air, there was a lady that came on, the first lady, that, the the first call-in speaker. She says, I need you pastor's help. She says, I woke up this morning and I didn't have any faith. I thought, that's because you went to bed and you didn't have any. How could you lose it over, I thought, how can you lose your faith overnight? You can't. You can't lose it overnight. You're allowing the enemy to work on your head. You cannot lose something that God gave you. You can deny your faith, but you won't lose your faith. Jesus won't walk away from you. He won't walk away from us, but we can walk away from him. We can say, Jesus, where are you? Remember the story of the two footsteps. Jesus said, those two footsteps you see, my son, is me carrying you. Jesus loves us. So we need the truth. We minister in hard places. We know God uses unworthy people. And we know we serve a great God. And we're in a battle that we cannot surrender. 
If you ever wanted to be in the military, the day you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, you just volunteered. or You just became, I wouldn't say you volunteered. You surrendered your old life and became a soldier for the army of God. And then in verse 19 to 20, because not everyone has strong faith. We're here to help the weak. And we can do it. We, we, we know when things aren't going right in their lives, we can pray for them. We can help them along the way. It's a choice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We know, Lord, the, the acrostic for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you died on that cross and shed your blood for the forgiveness for all that call upon your name. We can't pray someone into the kingdom of God. We can't accept Jesus for them. But by golly, Lord, we can surely tell them. And we need to tell the lost. We need to... I believe, Lord, our churches today are not focusing enough on telling others, telling the congregations about the love of Jesus Christ and what He has done for mankind and what He will do for that lost sinner. And Lord, we, I want to lift up our president, his staff. It just seems like, Lord, no matter... We, we used to say... The nation of Israel is in the news every day. Now our president is in the news every day because the majority party wants to take him down. Lord, we know there's Bible studies, there's prayer meetings going on within the White House today. We know, Lord, that our president and his staff are being ministered to by many different pastors around the U.S. So, Lord, we pray that you would just place a hedge of protection around them Helping them, Lord, to see more and more of you as each and every day goes by. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here tonight. That, Lord, we're, we are in the battlefield. Maybe not here inside of Harvest Life Christian Fellowship. But when we walk out them front doors, we are truly not just in a battlefield, but we are in a mission field. We have been given an opportunity, Lord, to share the love of Christ. May the things that we do, we say, we act, may others see in us the love of Jesus. Lord, I pray for, I know, I want to pray for Bruce, Lord. He's got pink eye pretty bad, he told me. And we know, Lord, that's pretty tough stuff. So we just pray, Lord, that you just reach down and touch him and make his body whole and healthy once again. We know, Lord, there's just a lot of people struggling with finances, maybe with their health, with sicknesses. So, Lord, we pray that you would just guide our hearts, help each and every one of us, Lord, to, during these times of trials and temptations and tests and so forth, Lord, that we just keep our eyes focused on you. Because we know, Lord, that all things can be done with you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's church said, amen.